Good to see all of you. So you have your Bibles open to the Gospel of Luke. There's two places to mark in your Bibles this morning. That'll be Exodus 12 and Acts chapter 8. If you need a Bible, raise your hand and we can make sure that you get one. I'd love for you to follow along with me for you to see these things yourself. So keep it up nice and high. There's a lady here. Keep it up nice and high if you need a Bible and we can get one to you. Um, I just want to say thank you to Aubrey for the last couple of weeks of teaching. I thought he did... A fabulous job. Very, very good. And um, I was blessed to to have him teach. Always blessed to have him teach. Blessed to have everyone teach. Ira, it's always a blessing to have you and Tracy. Guys teaching. Lots of stuff going on in the world. You guys have been watching everything taking place. Everything going on. All the wars. All the craziness going on over there in Israel. You guys have been watching that. How can you not watch what's going on? Well, thankfully, the, the bombing has, has stopped, but the war is certainly not over. Remember, the Lord Jesus tells us that as we get closer to the end of times, that there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. And uh, certainly, uh, if you've been watching and doing your research, you know, you know that, um, that Iran is, is uh, supplying all the surrounding um, countries and uh, terrorist organizations such as Hamas and Hezbollah uh, in the surrounding area. And rockets have been firing not just from um, the Gaza Strip, but they've been firing from Syria and from Lebanon and, and all over the place. And so as we've been going through Luke and looking at the end times, uh, as we were mentioning a couple of weeks ago, um, as we get closer to the end, the whole world is going to come against Israel. The whole world is going to come against Israel, all because they do not want them to exist. They do not want um, the Jewish people in that land, and they don't want them to exist. And so um, we pray. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for them. We pray for the leadership. We certainly pray for the the, the Palestinians there and the, the Israeli Arabs and, and everyone in that area. We just need to be lifting them all up. Uh, pray that the gospel is is preached in uh, in every corner in every area. So, nothing really, um, you know, it was, it was frightening and scary watching it all happen and watching it take place. But um, you know, nothing has has changed really as of yet. So we're just just keeping an eye on everything that's taking place over there. So we are in the Gospel of Luke, chapter twenty two. If you haven't turned there yet. Um, There are lots of profound things happening in this section of Scripture that we're going to look at today, verses 7 through 13. There is no way that I could possibly cover all of them, so I'm just going to try my best to focus on just a couple of them today. We are moving closer in the Scripture uh, to the Lord's crucifixion, which is going to take place on Passover, and there's a lot of preparation that has to take place for Passover And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we go throughout the study. But let me just say that our Heavenly Father is preparing many different things uh, during this Passover. Number one, He's preparing His Son, His Son to be the Passover. And then we see the Son, the Lord Jesus, preparing His disciples during this Passover. And this is what we're going to see in this section of Scripture. What do I mean that Jesus is preparing the disciples uh, during this time of Passover. The Spirit, I believe, gives us insight in what we're going to look at to see that Jesus is preparing his disciples to learn to trust him, to learn to trust his word, to learn to obey him. That is to learn to obey, listen now, his very word, his specific instructions. For you see, they will soon have to navigate through this dark world without him. In just a few short days, he's going to be gone. And his words will be the very thing that guides them. John records Jesus telling them in John chapter 14 that the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring To your remembrance, he says, all the things that I say to you. Can you imagine? You're with the Lord for, you know, three years or so, and then he's gone. Now, how do you navigate through life? Listen, the Holy Spirit brings to remembrance 
all the things that the Lord Jesus has said to them. And so when they come upon you know, specific situations, when they come across certain people, how did Jesus deal with them? What did the Lord say about this particular situation? Oh, yes. And then this is what they do. So he's preparing them. The title of today's message is God's Preparation. And the first thing that we see being prepared for Passover here in this section of Scripture is Jesus himself. So look at verse 7. It says, Then the day came the, then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And we're going to stop there. Make no mistake, the Spirit tells us through the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians that indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Remember, each family was required to bring a lamb into their homes five days before they sacrificed it. If you have Exodus 12, Mark, turn to Exodus 12. We'll look at this. We've looked at this before, but I think it, it helps us to go through it one more time. Picking up in verse 1, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of, of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month, and then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Remember, the purpose of this, to bring it in uh, so early before, the, before they sacrifice it, was to inspect it. It was to draw near to it. It was to get attached to it. It was to then sacrifice it. Jesus, the Lamb of God, if you remember, came into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday, came into Jerusalem that we looked at, drawing near to the millions, literally millions of people that have descended upon Jerusalem for Passover, under much scrutiny by the religious leaders, and the Lord himself will be sacrificed. It is important for believers to understand at least two things regarding Jesus and the Passover. Number one, Jesus fulfills the Mosaic law becoming the Passover lamb. And number two, this is very important, Jesus is obeying the Mosaic law in observing Passover. And so these two events have confounded many people throughout the ages in this way. How can Jesus observe the Passover meal, and at the same time be sacrificed on Passover. How is that possible? Well, let me first say, this is not a problem for God. This is a problem for man. It's hard for us to reconcile these two events when we don't have uh, complete information about the chronology of these events. And so I just want to share with you what I've found that seems to give us some answers in regards to this. So number one is the reckoning of days. Remember, the Jews calculate a day from sunset to sunset. The Romans calculate a day from sunrise to sunrise. Remember, the nation of Israel is, is where? They're living underneath Roman occupation. That means they're living under Roman governance, under Roman law, under Romans' rendering of time. It appears in John's gospel that the religious leaders are going by the Romans' calculation for a day. That's one thing to consider. And you love when people say, pin that right here, just pin it, pin it right there. So I'm going to say to you, I know it sounds cheesy, but we're just going to pin that consideration there for just a moment. Another thing to consider is the enormous task of sacrificing lambs for the nation. In his book, The Temple, Its Ministries and Services, Alfred Edersheim writes this. He says, How large the number of worshipers was, that is, Passover worshipers, may be gathered from Josephus, who records that when Cestius requested the high priest to make a census, 
in order to convince Nero of the importance of Jerusalem and of the Jewish nation, the number of lambs was found to be 256,500. Can you imagine? 256,000 lambs being slaughtered, being slain, which at the lowest computation of 10 persons to every sacrificial lamb would give a population of how many class? It says it up there. 250, uh, 2,565,000. Or as Josephus himself puts it, 2,700,200. Uh, so think about it. Can you imagine the enormous task of sacrificing that many lambs? Could it, could it be done in one evening or one day? Another thing for us to consider is it appears at this time that the nation of Israel observed what has been called, listen now, two Passovers. Two Passovers. One on the 14th day, which is Passover, which is prescribed in Exodus um, chapter 12, and then one on the 15th day, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, so one on each sunset. Now of all the people who attested to two Passovers, believe it or not, was Constantine himself in his anti-Semitic address to the Council of Nicaea. He says this, How can they be in the right, they who after the death of the Savior have no longer been led by reason, but by wild violence as their delusion may urge them? They do not possess the truth in this Easter question, for in their blindness and repugnance to all improvements, they frequently celebrate two Passovers in the same year. We could not imitate those who are openly in error. How then could we follow those Jews who are most certainly blinded by error? For to celebrate the Passover twice in one year is totally inadmissible. So certainly two Passovers could help ease the enormous task, if you will, of preparing over a quarter million lambs for over two and a half million people. I mean, just think about it. It's just crazy. So here's what I'm gathering. That Jesus and the disciples observed the Passover on the 14th day of the month, as recorded by Matthew, Mark, and Luke, while the religious leaders observed the Passover the next day, the 15th, as recorded by John in John chapter 18. So now the question still remains. Why did Jesus, God incarnate, second person of the Trinity, who without him nothing was made that has been made, why did this Jesus observe the Passover? Yes, to observe the Mosaic law, which we mentioned, but I honestly believe, like his, bat, like his baptism, that Jesus is identifying with humanity. Jesus didn't need to repent. He didn't need to have his sins covered. No, he identified with us in his humanity so that you and I can identify with him in his righteousness. Remember, the Spirit says through the apostle to the church in Rome, for we have been united together in the likeness of his death. Certainly, we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. Think about it now. The disciples' preparation on this day starts with observing Jesus being prepared for Passover. They see Jesus come into Jerusalem before the Passover, they see him go through intense scrutiny by the religious leaders. They see him being obedient to the law in observing Passover. And now comes time for their obedience. Look at verse 8. Jesus says then to Peter and John, Go prepare the Passover for us that we may eat I'm going to stop there for a moment. Let me ask you, have you ever heard the Lord say, go? Have you ever heard the Lord say, go? I want you to go. I want you to go and minister over here. I want you to go and speak to that person at the gas station. I want you to go speak to the person in the grocery store. I want you to go speak 
to the person in the parking lot, or I want you to go speak to a family member. Have you ever heard the Lord say, go and do this task? Listen, it's very much like the Lord to simply say go and not give all the instructions until you go. It is very much like the Lord. Remember the Lord said to Abram, recorded in Genesis chapter 12, to get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land I will show you. Notice the instruction first is to go. It's to go. Listen, if Abraham is not going to go, then there is no need for the Lord to show him anything beyond that. And to my knowledge, and in my experience, the Lord has not changed this method of preparation and of training. So what what does that mean? That means the Lord will train you and me just like this. This is a type of obedience that's been coined as sequential obedience. If you have Acts chapter 8, Mark, turn to Acts Chapter 8, we see this in Philip's account with the Ethiopian eunuch. And we're going to pick up in verse 26 of Acts chapter 8. It says, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. That's right. This is desert. We're just going to keep reading. There's so much I want to say. So he arose and went. But understand, stop. <laughs> that's has got to stop. That's all he told them. Just go. See, and this is, uh, Tracy and I, we always say, this is what the Lord said to us. I want you to rise and go south. Go to the south. So that's, we came to the south. So he rose and he went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charged all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship was returning and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. And then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. And so Philip ran up to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. And then he knew. He said, hey, do you understand what you're reading? Could you imagine? Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before its shear is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And so the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? And then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, there's water. What what hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, well, you see, before you do that, you have to go to a class and you have to do this and you have to do that. He said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Good enough. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Craziness. So again, God, through the angel, just tells Philip to go. And if Philip had never obeyed the Lord's command to go, he would have missed out. He would have missed out on this incredible blessing that God had for this Ethiopian. Now, did God need Philip? And the reason why I pose that question is because some people say, well, God doesn't need me. No, no. God didn't need Philip, but listen, God was graciously allowing Philip to be a part of what he is doing. How amazing is God? Does God need us? No, he doesn't need us. But he gives every single one of us incredible opportunities to be a part of what he is doing or what he is going to do. 
Philip now was a part of helping this Ethiopian come to faith in Jesus, number one, which ultimately led to, listen now, bringing the gospel to Africa. Number two, number three, it resulted in Philip's own personal blessing. Think of the personal witness now that Philip has of God. How many of us can say that we've been raptured after you know, the Lord told us to go and speak to this person and then we were, you know, we were taken up and we were placed somewhere else? How many of us have that witness, that testimony? Not many of us, if any of us. If you've had that testimony, I need to hear it. <laughs> what an incredible thing. Jesus is preparing his disciples on this Passover day our first step in God's command is to obey. When he says, go, listen, we are living in a time when we need to obey the Lord's command like never before. And see, the problem is that the enemy has instilled fear in a lot of us. When the Lord says, I want you to go and speak, we're like, oh, but Lord, if I go and speak, that person's going to get really angry. Or Lord, if I go and speak, this is, this, a riot could break out. Or Lord, if I go and do, right? I said this before, the Lord needs men and women who are full of courage. He needs his church to be filled with men and women who are full of courage. Courage to love like we've never loved before. Our first step in God's command is to obey. The next step, as we see, is to observe. Look at verse 9. So they said to him, well, where do you want us to go prepare? And the Lord said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Isn't that, I just find that fascinating. But here is the same thing that he, you know, we see uh, with Philip in his story. Right? And in verse 27 back in Acts, it says, so he went and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a, a, a eunuch of great authority, right? He went and he observed. His first response was to obey the Lord. The second response was to obey his, his other command, which is to observe. Philip observed. What do you see? Peter and John observe. What do you see? John, Kelly, Mike, Peter, whatever your name is, what do you see? What do you see? What is God showing you? Now, it was very rare for men to carry water in the first century. It wasn't unheard of, but it was rare. Why? I don't know, because water is incredibly heavy. Let's have the women do it. Okay, sounds great to me. So if you remember the Lord's encounter with the woman at the well... She was there doing what? She was there getting water for her needs. So a man carrying a pitcher of water, it was a sign to Peter and John. And the instruction here, the training here was to observe, catch this now, before you speak. Observe before you speak. Remember what the Spirit says to the Apostle James? So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear slow to speak and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now I know, I know, I know, this can be frustrating for a lot of people to simply go and observe and not say anything. Listen, a good thing to do as you're observing is to pray. Pray. Okay, Lord, I'm here. Lord, I'm looking around. What is it that you want me to see? Pray. Pray to the Lord. You know, I was once counseling a couple where the, the wife was extremely frustrated about a particular situation, and I, and I asked her, well, what does your husband think? And out of her frustration, she just abruptly answered, oh, well, he won't do anything. All he ever does is pray. Listen, the Lord prepares his disciples to be swift to hear, slow 
to speak. The main reason the Lord wants us to observe and be slow to speak, listen, is so that when we speak, we only say what he wants us to say. Look at verse 11. He says to them, then you shall say. Do you, you see what's going on here? He's giving his disciples specific instructions to follow. This is, I want you to go. This is what you're going to see. And this is what I want you to say. Say, then you shall say to the master of the house, whatever you want, guys. Say whatever you want. He doesn't say that, does he? He says, say this. The teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? You see that? Look very carefully at the Lord's instruction. Jesus knows that they will be tempted to say something other to this man other than what the Lord is telling them to say. Listen now. Don't do it. Don't do it. When the Lord gives us a word of knowledge... When the Lord gives us a word of wisdom in a situation, we need to be very, very careful to only speak what his word says. And listen, nothing more. Nothing more. We're going to be tempted to give our opinion. We're going to be tempted to vent our frustration or our wrath. We'll be, we'll be tempted to take matters into our own hands, but don't. Do it. Don't do it. This is the principle behind what the apostle instructs the church in Corinth when he says this, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, listen now, that you may learn. That you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. That none of you may be puffed up on behalf of of one against the other. If Peter and John said anything differently to this man other than what Jesus told them to say, they would have messed up the whole thing. They would have messed it up. Why is Jesus giving them specific instructions? Why is Jesus only sending Peter and John? Remember, Judas has conspired with Satan himself. Judas is looking for a time. He's looking for a place in which to betray Jesus. Even though Judas thinks he's in control, he has no idea that it's actually Jesus who is in control. Jesus is the one who is orchestrating when and where his betrayal will take place. And he's allowing Judas to play that role. Judas cannot know ahead of time why. He can't know where this meal is going to take place. Listen, the Lord has reasons. The Lord knows the future. He has perfect timing in all of our lives. Sequential instructions require sequential obedience. First, to go, observe, speak only what the Lord is telling us to speak. And lastly, for a section of Scripture, is to begin to prepare, that is to get things ready. Listen, for the Master. To get things ready for our Master, for our Lord, and our Savior. The whole reason why God is calling us, the whole reason why God is telling you to go is because whatever it is, I guarantee you, wherever he's calling you, whoever he's asking you to speak to, he's asking you to prepare for him, not for us. It is to prepare whatever it is for the master. It's to get ready. So verse 12, it says, Then he will show you this man who they're supposed to follow, a large furnished upper room, you know what's amazing about that, um, that upper room, that, that word? It's, um, oh gosh, why did it just leave me? It's the word aliyah, right? Which, which means that we go up. It's, we're going up. We go up to worship. We go up to Jerusalem. It's the word aliyah. We go up to the upper room. So they went and they found it just as he said to them and they prepared the Passover. Imagine the disciples' eyes when they walked into this large, beautifully furnished room. What an incredible sight. I think that they were probably thinking, wow, 
wow, this is, this is awesome. Hey, it's good to know Jesus, right? This is great. So once the disciples knew where the Passover meal was going to take place, they had to begin to prepare the Passover meal, which, according to the Messianic Jewish scholar, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, he writes this. He said, this includes taking the Passover lamb to the temple. Here the lamb was slain. Its blood was poured into a bowl, carried to the altar, poured out at the base of the altar. During this whole process, they would sing what is called the Hallel Psalms. That is praise psalms. Psalms 113 through 118. And I should have had you mark this. Turn to Psalm 118 because it's just incredible. This is one of the psalms that they, they, uh, they sing. Psalm 118. And we're not going to read the whole psalm, but I want you to look at verse 21. Psalm 118, verse 21. This is what they sing on the day of Passover. Jesus is their Passover. They sing, verse 21, I will praise you for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected, is that not just, that should give you goosebumps, has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God. I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. His son will pay the price for all of humanity. His mercy endures forever. His blood will be shed for all of humanity. His mercy endures forever. He will rise from the dead. His mercy endures forever. This is what they're singing. Part of the disciples' preparation was worship. It was worship. As they made preparations for the master, listen, their hearts had to be in a place of worship. But hear me out, everyone. Whatever God is calling you to do, and I pray you hear him speak to you. I pray that you hear him say go. I suspect he is telling many of you to go do something, to go do this particular thing, go do this thing, and you're sitting there going, well, does God need me? He's saying go. Because the place that he needs you to go prepare for him, he wants to do something there. He wants to do something with you. And what's going to, how do you prepare the place? And this is, it's easier than we think it is. What we need to do is go to where he's asking us to go and to worship him in that place. That's how we prepare for the master. The beautiful truth is God will call us. He's calling us. There is nothing more beautiful, nothing more powerful, nothing more transformational than when we prepare a place for the Lord through worship. Let's pray. Father.